We just want to thank you, Lord, for giving us another day to give you praise, Lord. You are so worthy, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning, Lord. Your faithfulness is, is just so awesome, Lord. So, Father, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace towards us. Thank you for your love towards us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, just give the Lord some thanks.
allergies you know it's just like you take medication it's like your mind gets all foggy <laughs>
just leads us and guides us, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that the, the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sometimes we just struggle, Lord, because the enemy is always pounding on us, Lord. But we know that our peace comes from you, Lord. We know you have the victory, Jesus. Amen. always been kings, lots of kings, and they fought one another for power. But we worship the king of kings, amen? The one that forgives us for our sins. The one that saved us. He is the mighty king. He is our king. There's only one king, amen? I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. The Spirit is within me because you and I rose again. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. 
Just thank you, Lord, that we belong to you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Amen. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've sung that song, but it gets me every time. Amazing love, how can it be that you, not just anybody, but you, my God, could die for me. That's a powerful thing to think about, isn't it? Well, welcome everybody. Good to see you here this evening. Good to see you all on Facebook again tonight. We are going to be um, continuing our study in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, grab them and open them up to Genesis 13. We went through verse 4 of 13 last week, so we'll be picking up in Genesis 13, 5 this evening. And we, we've got kind of a lot of ground we're going to cover today, so hang in there. Uh, we're going to do a lot of reading here, uh, and you'll see why. But the, the message is called Lot of Trouble. <laughs> it's a really bad one, but it was funny to me when I put it up there today, you know. Lots of trouble, so you'll see why in, as we get into it here. But let's have another word of prayer before we get into the word. Heavenly Father, just... Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can worship you tonight. I pray, Lord, that you were blessed by that worship. And Lord, now would you just bless us back by the teaching, and not only the teaching, but the understanding of your word this evening, Lord, as you explain it to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So remember last week that we finished up with Abram. Remember, after his failure of faith, his lapse of faith, he returned back to the area of between Bethel and Ai, where he once again begins to worship the Lord. So we're going to pick it up here in Genesis 13, 5. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So between the amount of flocks there were, between Abraham's and Lot's flocks, there were so many that something had to be done here because there just wasn't enough land for all of them to graze on. Now, 
I could teach on this in many places and they wouldn't understand this, but here in Prescott, in Prescott Valley and, and Dewey and uh, Chino Valley and Paulden, we can kind of understand that, can't we? Because we can look around, we can see the cattle grazing, you see we get too many, they have to share the land, it's not gonna work. So what was happening was the herdsmen were striving against each other. Now, they weren't doing bad because that was their job to protect their master's flocks, but they, they were kind of coming to uh, disagreements here to protect those flocks. Now, it says that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were in the land at the time. Why do they bother mentioning that? It seems kind of random, doesn't it? Okay, big deal, they were there. But there's two likely reasons. We've mentioned the Canaanites before, but uh, it may be that they also controlled part of the land. We don't know for sure, but that's a possibility. And it's that land that was promised to Abram. And, and if that was true, and they had their flocks grazing there too, now we have you know even more trying to feed in this one area of land here. But there's another possibility, and I think it's a good possibility that they may have been mentioned. There's a good possibility that they were mentioned here to teach us something important, which is these were two pagan groups. These were not believers in Yahweh. And what did they see? They saw infighting between family members of, Lot, or of uh, Abram. And of course, Abram, as we know, had a reputation of being a man who worshiped God. So they may have been looking at this going, well, you know, Abraham's family or Abram's family are supposed to be God worshipers and look at them. What are they doing? They can't even get along here. They can't fix this problem here. Now, did that sting a little bit as you heard that? If it didn't, it should. Because how many non-believers today, how many times have you heard them say, all oh, those Christians, they can't agree on anything. Look at how many different denominations they have because they can't agree on things. And they might even say not only that, but they argue and they fight amongst each other. And sometimes it appears that they even hate each other. And they would be saying, why would I want to be like them? And maybe this is what the Canaanites and Perizzites would be saying. Why would we want to be like these supposed God worship leaders here. Now look, that is probably not a completely accurate assessment of the Christian church, and yet we all know there is some truth to it, isn't there? There's some truth to that. And I hate it when we give non-believers ammunition. Psalm 133, one says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then, of course, Jesus said in John 17, 23, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. Why? So the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And then Paul wrote to the Colossians, it's in chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Paul says, so as to those who have been chosen of God, all right, now that should say to you, that's me. If you're a Christian, you were chosen of God, okay? As to those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. In verse 14, he said, Beyond all these things, put on love. Now get this, which is the perfect bond of unity. So what's the key to unity? Now, don't get me wrong. Doctrine is important, as you well know. But the key to unity is love one for another. And not some worldly version of love, because as we know in 1 Corinthians 13, we're told there that love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So there's times when we have to speak the truth in love. 
And look, we know that in the church, there's always going to be some disagreements. Disagreements on certain matters of style of worship. Sometimes on a doctrinal emphasis, which is what's emphasized a little more than the other. And there's certainly going to be differences in church government. But, you know, the structure of church government, there are very few rules that Paul wrote down for the structure of church government. He never wanted it to become some legalistic thing that everybody had to do everything a certain way. He was done with that. That was the law. We're under grace. And there's grace in how you run your church government. We have a few basic things that he gave to us. And look, there are some very important doctrinal issues that sometimes we have to divide with people who say they're Christians over. But even that, even if we're divided, none of that should ever cause us to despise our brothers and sisters in Christ. None of it should cause us to fight with one another. And unfortunately, I see a lot of that in the church today. It's one thing to speak out and say, look, we believe you're wrong here. But boy, the attitude of some of the people that I see that do that is certainly not an attitude of love. It's an attitude of, I'm right, you're wrong. Get squared away. You guys know from this pulpit, when I see something wrong in the church, I will call it out. Amen? But I hope, and if I ever don't, you call me out. <laughs> because I hope I'm doing it in love. I don't do it because I want to call it out. I do it because, look, we want to stay close to what the scripture says. We don't want to wander away. But I don't want to despise or hate or fight with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, we're going to see here Abram, who, who, who we see is definitely growing in his faith. He comes up with a solution to this. It's in verses 8 and 9. So Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Now, I cannot overemphasize the generosity of this offer from Abram to Lot. You see, the land has been given to Abram, not Lot. And Abram is entitled, entitled to all of it. Now, one thing he could have done, he could have just said, okay, Lot, you want to graze here? You got to pay. And you know what? That would have been fine. There would have been nothing wrong with that. It would have been a righteous act to do. But instead, look what Abram does. He gives Lot the choice to take any part of the land Lot wants. If you go this way, I'll go that way. If you go that way, I'll go this way. This is unbelievable, an unbelievable act of generosity on Abram's part. Abram is certainly fulfilling a New Testament exhortation in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. You remember when Paul said, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Abram is certainly doing that, and it certainly shows us how much his faith is growing at the time. See, he's not worried now about which part of the land Lot will choose. He's trusting that whatever part Lot chooses, God's going to provide for me and my family. He wasn't worried about it. And he doesn't try to scheme it out like he did in Egypt, right? And lie about it. Like, hey, Lot, you can take whichever one you want, but hey, you know, that side over there is really probably better. No, he doesn't do that. Rather, he just shows Lot great love great generosity, and he demonstrates that his faith in God is growing. Unfortunately, we'll see that through this act of generosity and faith on Abram's part, this actually becomes a stumbling block for Lot. And we'll see why later. Verse 10 in Genesis 13. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, it's so neat that that's put in there. 
because a lot of biblical critics like to say, no, that wasn't a well-watered place. Well, it was before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. It says, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Verse 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Now, according to the customs of the day, Lot should never have accepted Abram's offer. Instead, he should have deferred to his uncle. In other words, Lot's proper response would have been something like this. Hey, Uncle Abe, I, that was supposed to be cute, so okay. <laughs> we'll work on it. I appreciate your offer, but look, you're the head of the family. You're the elder, and God gave you this land. He should have said, Uncle Abe, please, you take the share of the land that you want, and I'll just take whatever is left over. And you know, had Lot followed that proper protocol, um, he may never have ended up in the kind of trouble that he ends up in. But Lot doesn't do that. He doesn't follow the custom of the day. Instead, he chooses the choicest, most fertile part of the land that he sees. And at that time, as the Bible says, it was like a Garden of Eden. But not only that, you notice that Lot keeps moving his tents toward where? Towards Sodom. And Lot knew that Sodom had this reputation for wickedness. That's why it's put in here. He knew. Now the expression in verse 10 really explains a lot. Verse 10, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Abram was walking by faith, allowing that God was going to provide for him and his family no matter what. But Lot, on the other hand, wanted to live by sight. He lifted up his eyes. And without consulting God whatsoever, at least <laughs> from what we see in the, in the word here, it doesn't say he consulted God. There's nothing about prayer. There's nothing about building an altar. None of that. So it seems that he never consulted God. And he thought what he was looking at was going to be what was best for him. He thought this is what's going to make me even more prosperous than I am now. You see, in the flesh, it might seem like Lot made the better choice. But by his choice to live near Sodom, Lot shows that he was making that choice in the flesh. There was something appealing to him about that place. Now, we note here, too, that Abraham, or Abram at this time, he was walking by the Spirit. He was choosing faith. And we notice, you know, that he doesn't even get upset that Lot took the best of the land. Did you notice that? I mean, he could have been, okay, I gave this great offer in his mind, he should have known what Lot was supposed to do is defer back to him. <laughs> but I don't think he even thought about it. I really don't. And he doesn't show that he's upset at all about what Lot wants to take. And remember, Abram loved Lot. In fact, he loved Lot like a son because he was a son to him. He had raised him from a young boy because his brother, Lot's father, had died. And I think what we see here is that after Abram's experience in Egypt, he is now ready to let God just direct him instead of trying to figure it out for himself. So he's content to settle wherever God tells him to go. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, 
For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Now, I find this interesting because Abram hadn't lifted up his eyes. He didn't even look out there. Whatever you choose, lot, I'll take the rest. But now God tells him, hey, Abram, lift up your eyes now. Look around. See where you're going. And God assures him once again of the promise that was made to him, the original promise. The promise says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And now he says, you're going to have so many descendants. They're as much as the dust of the earth and that no one would even be able to count them. And he reassures Abram once again that it is his descendants that will inherit the land. Now, we need to remember at this time, Abram is somewhere in his 70s to 80s, and he still doesn't even have yet one child as God makes his promise to him. Verse 17, arise, walk about the land. Maybe God was part Australian, I don't know. Boy, they're just <laughs> either there or over your head. Right, come on, walk about. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came to dwell by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there, what does he do again? He built an altar. So God is basically saying, hey, Abraham, go check out this land. Journey through it that I've giving to you. So Abraham moves south uh, of Jerusalem in this area in Hebron, which is called the Oaks of Mamre. Mamre is a person as well as a place. Now, these next 11 verses that we're going to read, um, they describe what would you would call a typical uh, skirmish in the ancient world here, where some powerful nations form a coalition uh, and then they war with other nations. They try to subjugate other nations. And it's all near the border of the land that God had promised Abram. So once again, what we're going to read is history. But the only reason it's recorded is because it's linked to Abram through Lot. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any purpose really in it being here in the scriptures here. But the reason I said it is history is because, once again, it's very interesting that for a long time, Bible critics said, oh, these, this is all made up. None of these people existed. These places didn't exist. But once again, the more archaeology we discover, the more it proves the Bible true. And many of these names of these people have been found. And now uh, people readily accept everything that's in this next 11 verses here. So we're going to go through it without too much comment here. Chapter 14, verse 1. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now, okay, quizzing you, Shinar is where? I got to do a better job of teaching. Babylon, the plains of Shinar. Uh, Ariok, king of Elisar. Shadar Laomer, king of Elam. And Tidal, king of Goem. Verse 2 that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, uh, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. Now you're gonna have a quiz tonight afterwards if you need to <laughs> memorize every single name I just gave you here, okay? Verse three, all these came as allies to the Valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea, 12 years uh, they had served Chedor Laomer, but the 13th year, they rebelled. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, these kings of the east, led by Chedor Laomer, we're going to call him Ched for short, <laughs> had subjugated these other five kings, including the king of Sodom and, and Gomorrah. And of course, the subjugated kings then had to pay tribute uh, to the kings of the east. Well, after 12 years, there was a rebellion. Cue the Star Wars music. The rebellion. <laughs> Verse 5. In the 14th year of Ched, 
and the kings that were with him came and defeated Rephaim and Ashtaroth Karnaim in the Zuzim in Ham and the Emim in Shaveh Kiriathim. I'm doing okay so far. Verse 6 And the Horites in their Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites. Now, some of these names, we're reading them because you're going to hear these names later and you'll be familiar with them. Who lived in the Hazazon Tamar. Verse 8 And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Siddim. Verse 9, against Chet, king of Elam, and Tyl, king of Goam, and all those same guys. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the conquerors, took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. Now, we finally get to what this is all leading up to. It's in Genesis 14, 12. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So much for choosing the best of the land. So much for living close to the city of Sodom. In fact, was Lot by now actually living in the city of Sodom rather than just being close by? Well, it seems like that may be true. And if it's not, we will see by chapter 19 that Lot is completely sucked into the city of Sodom. He stands at the gate in place of authority. But in any case, Lot here now is taken by these men. Verse 13, then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew, now he was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, and those were allies with Abram. Now you notice here that this is the first time Abram is called Hebrew. The first time. And of course, um, we know from our study before that that came from one of his ancestors named Eber, but also the Septuagint translates the word Hebrew as one who passes. And of course, one thing we know about the Hebrews, they passed a lot, didn't they? They traveled a lot, they moved around a lot, they were ones who passed. But it's mentioned here, I think, in order to distinguish Abram's tribe from the Amorite. That's why it's mentioned. Now these allies that are mentioned here, um, they're possibly mentioned because it is possible that they actually helped Abram in his next quest here. But we don't know that for sure because that's not what it tells us here. Verse 14, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So Abram is going to go chase these guys down, and he is going to rescue Lot. And we notice how many warriors did he have? 318 trained warriors. Now, that gives us an idea of how wealthy Abram was at this time. I mean, that doesn't include all of his other servants that he had. Then he had 318 who were actually trained warriors to go and to fight this battle. Now that's minuscule compared to what he was going to go up and fight against. We're not told here, but we know through history that the armies that they were going to face were going to be much bigger. Well, verse uh, 15, he divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So Abram, you see, devises this plan. And, you know, you got to kind of think God must have just told him what to do. It doesn't tell us for sure that Abram certainly wasn't a trained warrior. But he devises this plan and we see that 
with the small band of army that he has, 318, he's able to rescue Lot and these other people and all the possessions. So once again here, Abram has proved his great love for his nephew Lot. Now Lot has caused lots of trouble. And not over yet. But Abraham loves him so much that he was willing to risk pretty much everything to save his nephew Lot. You know, John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. But here's what I want you to notice. Because of Abram's love for Lot, other people were beneficiaries of that love. Other people were rescued with Lot. Many others who had been captured, who were probably looking at a life of slavery, were rescued by Abram because of his love for Lot and his willingness to risk everything to save him. And I think this is such a great picture for us. Have you ever thought about the fact that when we truly love people the way Jesus told us here, and we demonstrate that love by laying down our life for someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that you step in front of them and take a bullet, but it might. It might. But really more, and I think what Jesus was even speaking about here was, yes, you may lay down your life for someone that way, but what about laying down your life for someone in an everyday basis? I often, when I'm doing premarital counseling, say that between, you know, the, uh, the spouses. And I always say to the man, if someone walked in here with a gun and pointed it at your wife, would you jump in front of her and take the bullet? Now, remember, I did that in California. If I'm counseling here, I'm going to say, would you pull your weapon and fire on the guy? Much better than jumping in front and taking the bullet, right? <laughs> but every guy ever ever asked that question, so it would say, of course I would. I would do anything. I would do anything for my spouse. And I believe them. But would you really do anything? You see, you jump in front and take a bullet, it's all over, you're done. I would venture to say it's really tougher to lay your life down for your spouse or for anyone else every single day of your life. But when we do that, do you realize that we might be setting someone free in a, in a spiritual sense when they see us laying down our life for them? Our willingness to show unbelievers just kindness, especially through practical actions, and, and even just the sacrificing of our time for them speaks volumes to people. And it can lead to their coming to know Jesus. I'm going to read you a story. This, is, this was written by a lady in 1977 named Olga Wetzel. I just want you to listen to this story. It says, the Greyhound bus slowed, then stopped. It was just a wayside stop with a garage and a small store. A young Indian, now remember this was 77, so now you have to say Native American. A young Indian stepped aboard, and after he had paid his fare, he sat down behind me. It was February. We were traveling from Flagstaff, Arizona to Albuquerque, New Mexico. The night was cold, as you can imagine, February. In the warm bus, the tired youth was soon asleep. But after about 20 minutes, he got up and walked to the front of the bus and to ask if we were near his destination. We passed her a long time ago, the bus driver snapped. Acknowledging he had known the boy was riding beyond his stop, he asked angrily, why didn't you get off? The quiet passenger's shoulders drooped. He turned and came back to his seat. Barely had he sat down when he rose again and went to the driver. Will you stop and let me off, he asked. I'll walk back. No, it's too far and too cold. You'd freeze to death. You'll have to go into Albuquerque and then take a bus back. Well, disappointment showed in his walk as he came back to his seat. Were you asleep, I asked him. Yes, and my sister was there waiting for me. He dropped into the seat behind me. I was returning to Wisconsin after serving a quarter term as a volunteer teacher in an Indian mission school. This experience had taught me the hard living conditions of the Indians in the area. 
the small adobe houses with earth floors, the lack of privacy in those one or two room houses. The role played by teenagers was very hard. There was no room for them at home, yet they were not really ready to go out on their own. All the while we were nearing Albuquerque, a large and strange city, I thought he must be wondering, what would he do after he got there? I turned to him and I asked, are you afraid? Yes, he said in a hate to admit way. Stay with me, I said. I'll help you get right on the right bus back. I talked to the driver and asked him, will you please check with the return driver so he need not pay return fare? Okay, the driver said reluctantly. Everything will be all right, I told the boy. You need not worry about anything. His eyes said, thank you. We rode on for possibly 10 more minutes. Then a hand tapped my shoulder. I turned to see my young friend leaning toward me. In a reverent voice, he asked, are you a Christian? You see, the smallest acts of kindness can set people free. You've given a witness that may lead to that person's coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know, whenever you do something like that, what happens? <laughs> you get more blessed than the person does, right? I, I've got many stories I could share with you, but I'm not going to do that tonight. But I would just say every time I've stepped out in that way, God has blessed me. And I know you have stories as well. Well, God blesses Abraham for his actions or Abram for his actions. How does he do it? By an appearance of who I'm going to call the mysterious Melchizedek. <laughs> it's in verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Ched and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba. That is the king's valley. Verse 18 of Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him, meaning Abram gave Melchizedek, he gave him a tenth of all. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Verse 22, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. Verse 24, I'll take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Now, we're not going to get into details about Melchizedek tonight. That's going to be a study for later on. We'll learn about him. But one thing we do see is that Abraham certainly views Melchizedek as a person who represents God, as a king and a priest. And thus he gives Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils of war that he has taken in, he has gained in the battle. Again, how much has Abram grown in his relationship with God? His tithe to Melchizedek is proof that he recognizes that it was God who gave him this victory. I can imagine him singing the song, I'm going to see a victory. Not only that, but Abraham's statement in verse 23 shows that he wants everybody to know. He wants everybody to understand that whatever he has, has been given to him by God, not by some other man. Remember, God promised Abram he would make him a great nation. Abram wants no man to get any credit for what God is going to do and has already done. This kind of reminded me of, uh, of a story that Chuck Smith, who started Calvary Chapel, and I don't call him the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement because Chuck would hate that. He was the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and God did an amazing work, and we have thousands of Calvary chapels all over the world through him. But I was reminded of this story that he told of, 
uh, there was a man who wanted to donate a million dollars. Now that would be at least like six or seven today, right? million dollars and I don't remember if it was for the purchase of the land or to help pay for the building but one of those two and Pastor Chuck said to the man you know I appreciate that you want to do that but I'm not going to receive it he said I want to make sure that God gets the credit for building Calvary Chapel not one man and so thank you but no thank you Pretty amazing huh now look if anybody here uh, the Lord places it on your heart to give living through Prescott a million dollars just do it anonymously so I don't have to make that same decision the pastor Chuck made okay I'm good with that and then we can say for sure I don't know God provided it amen oh uh, yeah you guys are going no no <laughs> But I appreciate so much Chuck's heart. It was the same as Abram. He just wanted to make sure that God gets the credit for aliens. Man. And, and I pray that for this church, that God always gets the credit for anything that's done and no man will ever take credit for what God wants to do. Well, we see here that again, that lots caused lots of trouble for Abram. It's not over yet, and we're gonna see that soon. But, but I think, Abram's example here should really encourage us. I mean, think about it. Do you have a family member kind of like Lot? <laughs> One that might take advantage of any situation? One that's caused some trouble? Now, some of you are saying, no, actually, I was Lot rather than Abram. I'm the one that caused the trouble. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that somewhere along the line, someone was like, Abram and love you so much that they might let you fail but they would come and be willing to rescue you I think a lot of us probably have stories like that but I think for us tonight what we want to do and what we want to hang on to is look we need to love like Abram loved Lot we need to love like Jesus said and we need to be willing to risk the time of our life in order that some people might be set free spiritually. I'm just going to give you one story. I'm going to end with that. Um, I was out buying a car one night, of all things. Um, and when you bought the car at this particular place, they would give you a voucher to go to this gas station and fill your gas tank up. You know, you're free tank of gas great you paid three thousand more than you should have for the car but you get a free tank of gas all good right well um i was filling up the car and i saw this young man he was standing at the front of the convenience store that was there and he looked pretty forlorn i'm sure he was probably asking people for money or for food and one of those times when god put it on my heart and i couldn't ignore it you know it was late at night i wanted to get home but um, I couldn't ignore it. And I went out and I chatted with this young man and uh, I, I just remember hearing his story. And you know, oftentimes you hear stories, you know they're not true and, and we get that. But I listened to his story and he had gotten kicked out of this apartment that he was living in. Um, there were drug deals going down and he didn't want to be a part of it. And so they kicked him out. Um, and then I asked him, I, I said, are you hungry? And he goes, well, I didn't want to ask. Now, how often does that happen? He said, I didn't want to ask. And I said, well, come on in and, you know, pick out whatever you want in here, whatever you want to eat. And so we went in, we ate, and then I listened to his story a little bit more, but I, I remember this um, as I was getting ready to leave. He said, you know, I know you probably hear this a lot, but I am a Christian. He goes, but I haven't been to church in a long time. And I don't think I've been loving the life the way God wants me to love it. And he goes, I just want you to know that you've encouraged me tonight to get back into church. Now, look, I don't know what God did with that. It really doesn't matter. What matters is, is that it was one opportunity to take and sacrifice a little bit of time to maybe set someone spiritually free. And that should be something that we all desire to do. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word. I thank you for the example of Abram. And Lord, we're going to see once again later on he was not perfect in his faith. Just as none of us are, Lord. But so many things he did were such great examples for us. And this was, in particular was one. To see his great love for his nephew, his willingness to risk what he had to save him. His integrity, Lord, in not claiming any credit for it and not wanting anyone else to get credit for it. His wanting to make sure that God Most High was glorified in this situation. Even his willingness to give Melchizedek, who he probably didn't know but recognized was a priest and a king. Even some of those spoils, Lord, all of those things just show us how much he is growing in his faith with you. And so, Lord, that's what we desire. We desire to just continue to grow in our faith, to use our faith, Lord, not just to read about it and hear it and say, oh, that's neat, but, Lord, to have it just really work in our lives and in our hearts. So we just ask tonight that you would fill all of us by the power of your spirit, that we might respond when you call us to do something like this, Lord that we would follow this example. So we thank you for that. And I pray tonight just your spiritual blessing on each person in here, Lord. And again, if they need any kind of healing physically, I pray, Lord, that you administer to them according to your purpose and your will. But even more, Lord, that if anyone needs ministering spiritually, maybe they're feeling a little dry right now, that you would just surround them with your love and the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that they would know you love them in the same way you loved Abram and that you want to work in their life in that same way. So God, thank you for what you have done for us and we just lift up this church to you as well, Lord. May we always be the church you want us to be. May we represent you and only you, Lord. And we'll give you the glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Listen, uh, just quickly, remember that Saturday, uh, no men's fellowship this week because it is Walk for Life Day. We will be meeting at, meeting at 9 a.m. in the front of the courthouse that faces Gurley Street. And uh, we haven't decided exactly how far we'll walk, but you can walk as far as you want. You don't have to walk the whole way, whatever it may be. But we're going to have a great time out there. We're going to raise money for our community pregnancy center. Uh, we are still currently, uh, we, we've raised more, but other people did too, so we're still in fifth place, you know, fifth place. I, I don't know. That's hard for me being a coach, you know, but uh, 
We don't want to pressure, of course, anybody. But hey, you still can give. Even if you're not coming, you can still give. We still have cards there, which uh, tell you how to give. And if you uh, are even online and you'd like to help us out there, you can go to the Walk for Life site and look up our uh, community pregnancy center here in Prescott and help that way. Um, there was one more. Th oh, yes. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, if you don't know, is the National Day of Prayer. And generally, uh, we would normally have a some kind of a service, but I have to admit, and I used to be in charge of this for Corona, so I'm embarrassed to say, we, it really caught me by surprise. I just hadn't been thinking about it. So we do want to encourage you, though, um, to pray for the nation tomorrow. And if you want the specific prayer points, just go to the National Day of Prayer website, easy to find, and they will give you a list of prayer points. And maybe you'll take one, you know, in the morning, one in the afternoon, and I think there's seven prayer points usually. And uh, and please be in prayer for all those things. It's it's really important that we do that. And if you feel like fasting tomorrow along with that, you know, God will honor that. So God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Stick around, fellowship, and uh, we'll see you Sunday morning, if not Saturday morning.